In the meantime, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Marie Estelle Ray from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Since 1999, the OECD has developed what has become the standard international benchmark for corporate governance. Since 1999 and endorsed by G20 leaders and the World Bank since the mid 2000s, the OECD's Corporate Governance Division helps policymakers and private sector leaders alike evaluate and improve the legal, regulatory, and institutional framework for corporate governance. Please join me for this fireside chat with Marie, who will discuss the global tides and changes in corporate governance with a focus on managing ESG risks and highlighting the key principles of corporate governance as issued by OECD for 2022 and beyond. Marie, over to you. Many thanks, Rania. Good afternoon to all, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be joining you today for this very important conference. Uh, as Rania said, yeah, the, uh, the OECD has developed some principles of corporate governance. We call them the G20 OECD principles on corporate governance because they have also been endorsed by the G20. Uh, there have been issues in 1999, and they've been revised in uh, 2015. And now we are engaging into a new review of, of the principles, especially in light of what we have been living in the last two years, as you all know, is the COVID-19 crisis. So the principle, you know, they cover six main pillars is, of course, the general governance, uh, corporate governance framework, but we touch upon also the right of shareholders, the role of stakeholders, the issue of institutional uh, investors and stock market, of course, also uh, disclosure and transparency. And we have a last section on the responsibility of the boards. So we have been looking, um, studying, analyzing in the OECD, you know, what is the impact of the crisis uh, on corporate governance and, and capital markets. They have some few key messages that derive from, from, from our analysis, and I would like to develop them, you know, uh, there's three points uh, that I would like to develop now. The first point is how to make equity markets support the recovery and long-term resilience. Of course, we all know that the recapitalization of companies is vital, not only uh, before, but much more now. And the road to recoveries is requiring very well-functioning equity markets to be able to allocate sustainable finance resource for long-term investments in various sectors, including the, the, the green sectors, I would say. Uh, today, we have more than 40,000 listed companies in the world, but since, uh, since 2005, we have noted a delisting trend. So that means that more than 30,000 companies have delisted from stock market globally. This one was mainly in the US and in Europe, but which is not the case in Asia. Asia stayed a very dynamic capital market. But what does that say to us? You know, this kind of delisting trend is that the delisting has not been matched with new listing. So that means there's a decline in listing from smaller companies, which now have much more difficulties in, in accessing public equity uh, financing. However, our research has shown that there is during the COVID-19, a record equity insurance of more than uh, 1 trillion US dollars. So that's also good news that there's some funds, you know, that are available. And that's also this, equity markets uh, can still serve, you know, uh, households because equity is the largest asset class av available to households. So this is why it's very important for governments and policymakers to make sure that corporate governance policies can protect savers across border. My second message relates to the adaptation of the corporate governance framework uh, in light of the crisis. Um, Again, we've noticed, you know, in our analysis, a real global increase in ownership concentration. In some markets, which is the case of the Gulf and MENA countries, you know, there's a dominance of companies group structure. 
We have also noted, you know, the rise of institutional investors in equity markets and also the role of government as a very important uh, ownership. So this kind of concentration is also something that is that would prevent smaller growth companies to also access equity markets due to this increased concentration. But this has led also to a special attention to the kind of inadequacies in national disclosure frameworks related to capital and control structures. We also all, all noted, uh, just a bit back here, we also all noted that there was an, there's a real call, you know, from the crisis to improve the risk and crisis management for all companies. It includes, of course, you know, risk on health, uh, supply chain, reputation, environment, and you know them and we can name them. Uh, and this, I want to flag the issue of the use of digital technology, which can be a very useful tool to really monitor and disclose the risk associated to, uh, to, 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 to the crisis and to the functioning of the companies. But it also raised the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, as, as managers of, of companies, you've all noticed that, uh, you know, with the teleworking, uh, you know, a remote participation in meetings, uh, even in general assemblies, you know, this can cause some cybersecurity issues that we need to, to also think of. There has been also a, a link to the COVID-19 outbreaks, you know, some concerns that company have kind of manipulated executive remuneration and bonus, and this has led to a renewed scrutiny on the conditions and the procedures for designing deciding and overseeing performance related pay. And a trend also today is also to link, you know, the performance and the pay to also ESG factors. We'll come back to that afterwards. Other issues that we have noted, you know, is the issue of debt order rights. This means that, you know, companies has been in financial, some companies has been in financial distress during the crisis. And government needs to really now think about how they can support the restructuring of viable companies, but also for non-viable companies, you know, how to support them in the process of this insolvency, uh, you know, structure and framework for them. So there's a need to really adapt the insolvency framework also as we go out of the crisis. The issue of diversity also, you all know about it, you know, they need to really have boards and managements more diverse and uh, better access to, uh, for women to the, 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 the leadership positions in companies. This is something that is also important. And then of course ESG, but we'll come back to that in the next slides. But what I want to tell you here is that it's very, the, the these adaptations, you know, are very important for boards they need to be very reactive to make sure that they grasp all these new trends and, and, and be ready, you know, for, for the future in, in adapting, you know, their functioning. So let's turn now to ESG. Uh, how to improve the management of ESG risk. Um, now we have 165 jurisdictions have presented the national plan to reduce greenhouse gas emission in line of the Paris Agreement, but this really still falls short to reduce, you know, the combined emission reduction to the target that we have, which is 1.5 degree, you know, uh, increase growth, you know, by 2030s compared to the post-industrial levels. So what, what does that create, you know, for investors and shareholders? Now a growing number of investors would like to really consider climate and in general ESG risk when they are making their investments, when they are engaging into a business. It's very important to know that company needs to be really aware about this, this really new, new trends. On the shareholder side, they are now more and more exercising their rights on ESG and climate related issues. For example, you know, they've been finding resolution for the adoption of production targets, They've been trying to nominate uh, directors with kind of an ESG sensitivity or with, with, with the, the goal to move the company strategy uh, towards lower carbon footprint. And another trend also is the, is the litigation. 
there has been much more litigation in the recent months and, and two years, you know, on the grounds of inadequate management of climate risk. So what we should be we should be doing, you know, to, to really improve, you know, this management of ESG risk. Um, so in terms of the companies, the companies, they really, really need to develop expertise, information channels, analytical tools, policies and practice to really assess their ESG risk factors. The boards on themselves, you know, they need to really demonstrate the leadership, the tone should come from the top, you know, to ensure an effective means of to ensure effective means of ESG risk oversight. They need also to establish very clear lines of responsibility and accountability all along, you know, the supply chain. So that means through within the company, but also with their subsidiaries. In terms of policymakers and regulators, they need to facilitate the development of comprehensive ESG frameworks because they need to help companies to be able to monitor and disclose ESG risk. And they need also to help them to produce, you know, kind of consistent, comparable and reliable climate related disclosures. And this is why now in the next line, you will see the kind of plenitude of frameworks and standards that exist today, you know, to disclose information on climate related and other ESG performance, risk and strategy. I don't want to go into details of these of this table, but it's just to show you the type of different institutions and systems that exist, you know, I think you've all heard about TCFD, you know, the, uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure, or um, the Sustainability uh, Accounting Standards Board, SASB, or again, the Integrated Reporting Framework Board, or the initiative of the FRS, the IFRS Foundation, you know, it's the International Financial Reporting Standards. All this, you know, is like a multiplicity of standards that we really, that companies need to deal with. And this is where, you know, there's some, possibly some hope, you know, in trying to combine all this. But I would like to give back the floor to Rania to dig a bit more into this, this issue, you know, of, of all the standards and framework in light of the COPs that has been, that has been taking place. Thank you so much, Marie. And, and building on that, you know, was there any kind of global ESG standards and business community commitments that were expected from COP26 or were outlined? And, and how can the private sector community and executive leadership take this forward towards COP28? Yeah, thank you, Rania. Yeah, uh, thank you for this question because it really leads me to, to 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 an important initiative that was that was launched during the COP26. Of course, people need to understand that the Paris Agreement is really what is the target. You know, when all governments, you know, committed to a certain level of growth in in, in gas emission, but the COP26 for the, for our purpose today. Uh, has uh, had a very important outcome that still need to be seen, you know, on, on, on the uh, on the um, on on the functioning of that is the announcement of the creation of the International Sustainability Standard Board. This is a board that has been announced by the FRS Foundation at the COP26, and this new institution issb as called as an acronym is as, as the objective to deliver like comprehensive global baseline of sustainability related disclosure uh, standards that could help you know the companies to have a, a, a clearer vision of what they need to disclose and why they need to disclose that is really to provide all the investors and the capital market participants with information on companies' risk and opportunity to make sure that the investors can take the right decisions. So this is a very important initiative. The, uh, the, the, fund, the, the board is now set up, you know, they have, uh, you know, all the staff and directors on that. 
but there's a lot of challenges also that are linked, you know, to, 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 to this board. They're supposed to come up by June, you know, with already some preliminary kind of standards on that. But of course, the issue of the cooperation between all the different uh, institutions, the acceptance by the, com by, 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 you know, global uh, acceptance, but also, and this is the last message I want to make, is also the transformation of these ESG standards into national legislation. Thank you, and Anna. Thank you, Marie, as well. And um, how, you know, going forward, can executive leadership and private sector um, uh, further drive ESG and corporate governance structures and support ESD, o, OECD and national governments on this agenda? What are one or two key top priorities um, that our community should consider? Well, I would have like to two, two important things for, for, for companies. The management needs to be committed and involved. They need to be changing the culture. They need to develop the skills to train their staff to really set the tone from, from, from the top, as I said before. This is also a director's duties, you know, in kind of balancing the shareholders and, and the stakeholders, uh, uh, you know, rights and interests. This is what we call a bit in our jargon, you know, the combination between the shareholder primacy and the stakeholder capitalism. So that's very important issues. And just to conclude, uh, what I want to, to, to show you in the last slide that you just uh, showed was the key priorities for the review of the G20 OECD principles on corporate governance, on which we are really heavily working at the moment, you know, where we want to address a number of issues. And I think also executive leaders need to have this broad vision of where we stand today, what are the topics that need to be really addressed, you know, to best understand and grasp the, 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 the very important issues. And one last point uh, I want to make also from, from, from the OECD, as we are engaging into this review of the principles, it's very important for us to have a very inclusive approach. So this is what, my message, you know, and I'm very happy to be speaking today because what you are doing in the Pearl Initiative uh, and through this conference you know, is to build awareness on all the standards of what leadership needs, needs to be doing. And it's also a call from the OECD to really get engaged also in what we are doing. You know, we will be trying to, be, to, to, to really be very inclusive and also to have a, like a meeting, a round table, you know, for the MENA region on corporate governance and the review of those principles, because we want to hear policymakers, stock markets, regulators, but also, uh, you know, companies and entrepreneurs. So thank you very much, Rania. I'll give you back the floor.